Spirit of the Living God is in our hymnals. Now don't get mad at me, but I'm not liking our hymnals very much. There are so many. I was looking for a holy, holy, holy last week, and it's not in here. How is that not in our hymnal? Holy, holy, holy is? 344 is the Spirit of the Living God. Well, fresh, that's why I never can't find it. Because I have the wrong name for it. Thank you, Miss Hannah. And there is another song, Saturday, two Saturday mornings ago. I was singing a song all morning long, just an old, you know, an old hymnal. And I came in Saturday morning meeting, said, hey, let's sing this song. And I pulled out the hymnal and could not find it in there. Now, it's the red one, but I think it's, is the red one the same hymn? It is, right? It's just a different cover? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was right under the song we just sang. <laughs> All right. Let's sing that song together. Uh, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me, hymn number 344. 34 4. That's what was about to come out of my mouth, I think. 344. All right, let's sing that together. Spirit of the Living God. Fall fresh on me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. That may be the best we've sang in a while. We all sang a song we knew together. All right, let's sing it again and uh, take note of the end of that song. Melt me, mold me, fill me, and use me. In order for the Lord to be able to work in our lives, we have to be moldable. And we don't always like to think of those days when God has to do a little melting to reform. He has to turn the heat up to melt us down and begin to reform us into the people that we ought to be. Those, those reforming times are not always enjoyable. But in order for us to be filled with the Spirit of God, we have to be submitted to the will of God and allow Him to be able to fashion us into the people that we should be. And so let's sing that again and think about what you're singing. Sing it unto the Lord. Don't just sing the words loosely and flippantly, but sing it as if you're singing it to the Lord. Let's sing that again, uh, uh, Spirit of the Living God, all on that first verse, the only verse. Uh, let's sing that together. Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Amen. Wonderful. All right. Let's sing Jesus is the sweetest name I know. It takes so much more water when the heat is blowing. Whew, my, my throat gets dry so fast. So forgive me. And I, I don't like my bottle all that much. I bring it everywhere I go um, for different reasons. I'm not going to get into all of that. But um, the... Uh, this time of this time of year, uh, my voice has been getting weaker and weaker and drying out faster. So I hate it when I'm when I'm preaching and then you can hear go, 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 coming out of the bottle. So that metal bottle makes slurping sounds. So not always my favorite. Um, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Let's sing that together. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name. 
And that's the reason why I love him so. For Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Ephesians chapter 5 in your Bibles, if you would please, this morning, Ephesians chapter 5. Being Vision Sunday as it is, um, I, I will be conducting Vision Sunday as I am familiar. And so it may not look like what we are familiar with as a church, but... Uh, My desire is that every church service, Sunday school, Sunday morning, and Sunday night, be a life-changing, spirit-filled church service. And that isn't always the case. Sometimes we as men fail, but God can always change His people through His Word and through His power. And so, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I somewhat, um, over the years, and some of my preacher friends and my pastor friends have noticed the same thing. Um, I somewhat don't look forward to big days in church because I've noticed a pattern over the years for whatever reason. And I don't know all the reasons for this, but I think maybe I know some of the reasons. Uh, Big days seem to be cold spiritually in response. And it seems like when we have promotions and big days and spring programs and fall programs and so on, when you get to that big day, when there's something else going on for the day, it might be, you know, a dinner on the grounds or a contest with the church or it might be a vision Sunday. It seems to me that, that a lot of times these Sundays end up being a little bit colder spiritually, that you can preach and preach and preach and fight the battle behind the pulpit to the best of your ability and the responses at the altar seem to be much colder. I think, first of all, because the devil fights us. I think also because our minds and hearts are sometimes focused on something other than the preaching and the services. And we're thinking about the activities later on. We're having fun for the day because of the theme of the day. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But I have grown less and less prone to have big days at church because it's my desire for God to always be able to move. And it seems to me like He he can't always move as well on big days. You can pack the church out and see more people sitting in the pews than you've ever seen before and see less people at the altar. And I've seen it over and over and over again. And so... I hope that today, throughout the course of the day, you'll allow God to speak to your heart. I'm glad that it's Vision Sunday, but my desire today is not to have Vision Sunday. My desire today is for each and every one of God's people to be changed. And so I hope that we'll allow the Lord to do that. Ephesians chapter number 5, we're going to get back into what it means to be like Jesus. The Bible says in verse number 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Jesus Christ loved us. And if there is anything that is known of him, it is that he did and does love us. And it was his love that caused him to give himself a sacrifice. We talked last week about how he gave himself as a sacrifice for us, but he also gave himself as a sacrifice to God the Father, a sweet-smelling savor. We talked about the Old Testament sacrifices that were made unto God to atone for mankind and for our sins, and how that when the sacrifice was offered, it was a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. And Of course, we understand that that smell that comes from the sacrifice on the altar is not pleasant to the nose. It wouldn't be as if you were to burn a candle or something in your house, uh, or in those days if you would have had a scented oil that was being used to uh, change the smell of an environment. It would not have been like that. To us, it would not have smelled sweet, but the reason that it was a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord was because it was a picture of what one day Jesus Christ would do for us and also because it was what it would take in order for mankind to be reconciled to God. And that's what made it sweet to Him, that man could be reconciled through that sacrifice and through the picture of that sacrifice of His Son. When Jesus Christ was offered on the cross of Calvary, that sweet-smelling savor that came into the nostrils of God was the smell of His Son's precious blood was applied for our sins. 
And sometimes we may misunderstand why that was sweet to the Lord, but it was sweet to the Lord because, again, I repeat, we could be reconciled unto Him. And that made it precious to Him. Now, Jesus lived His life as a sacrifice. We looked at some of those things last week that He sacrificed of His time and rest. Remember when He took His disciples to rest after the death of John. The people thronged Him and He had compassion on them. And He preached unto them and taught them and then He fed them. That even when He tried to get away, uh, there in Matthew 14 and in other places, even when Jesus tried to get away, there were often times that uh, there were things that would come up and He would be required to minister to His people again. He sacrificed of His time and of His rest for us. He lived a life of sacrifice. He sacrificed of His own strength. Um, I don't know if we spent a lot of time on this. Did we spend much time on Him sacrificing His strength? Look at Luke chapter number 8, if you would please, this morning. Luke chapter number 8. And look at verse number... Oh... We're going to read to verse number 43, but let's begin in verse number 1. Just kidding. Uh, verse number 43, let's begin there. Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 43. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Now, <laughs> it amazes me the relationship that they had with Christ to be able to ask him that kind of a question. Jesus, don't you see all these people around, around you and you're asking who touched you? How are we supposed to know? Whew, Peter. Verse number 46, and Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me. For I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. He was heading to heal that daughter. And as he was on his way, he healed others. When the Bible says here that Jesus says, I perceive that virtue is gone out of me, that word virtue means strength, power, ability. Paul said, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. We often quote the first part. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. We often leave out the second part. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Jesus sacrificed of himself and gave of his strength to others. As a Christian, we are called upon to love the brethren and to love the lost. And that takes sacrifice. It takes strength. And often you have to give of your own strength in order to be able to love people on a regular basis and do for them as we should. Paul spoke of the fact that he was willing, very gladly, to spend and be spent for the church of Corinth. And that took great strength. We talk about, or, or we see in the Scriptures, the account that Paul gives us of the many and abundant uh, tortures and trials that he experienced on the behalf of others and on the behalf of Christ. It takes strength 
in order to serve God on a regular basis. It takes strength in order to, to, to serve others on a regular basis. And we have to be willing to sacrifice of our own selves in order to do so. And Paul said that in order that, or, or in the times that he was uh, willing, gladly to spend and to be spent, that he did so out of love for the people that he was doing that for. But he said, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. And sometimes we want to, we want to think that we should only sacrifice for those that are loving to us. Now, Christian, it's, it's a good thing to be sacrificial for your family and for your friends. But can you sacrifice of your strength and give of yourself for people that don't love you back? We can say that we would and we can say that we do. We, we can say that, that we're willing to spend and be spent for all of God's people while at the same time we lash out at each other and find reasons to get angry at each other at a moment's notice. You see, to be truly Christian, to be truly Christ-like, we have to be willing to give of our strength to people who don't love us back. And that's difficult for the flesh. Our flesh has no desire to do something kind for somebody who is our enemy. And for some reason, some Christians think it's a badge of spirituality that they can stand against those who have stood against them. Well, I'm standing for what's right, and they did this, and so they deserve it. That's not a, that's not a mark of spirituality. It's, it, it's a mark of immaturity. It's not easy to sacrifice your strength for people who will not return it. And matter of fact, might hate you for it. But that's what Christ did. You understand that he went to the house of Israel even knowing that the majority of the house of Israel would reject him? And that for the longest time, he said, don't go to the, lost, don't go to the Gentiles, but go to the, rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Knowing that Israel was going to reject him and eventually be the reason he was going to give his life. And he gave all of his strength on the cross of Calvary to people who despised him. That's what sacrifice looks like in the Christian life. And when welling up in our flesh comes this desire to lash out at somebody because they treated us this way or they said that, okay, fine, then why don't you tell Paul all about that one time? Why don't you tell Paul all about that one situation that you'll never forgive? Tell him. Why don't you tell Jesus about how hard you have it? That others are mean to you. That they've mocked you. That they've hurt you. I don't have the patience for them, Lord. Just judge them. Now, there were times that even David prayed for the Lord to bring vengeance upon His enemies. But your Christian brother is not your enemy. No. The enemy of the righteous is the wicked. The enemy of the righteous is that which is principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. Is everybody okay? That's our enemy. Not each other. Not the person sitting in this room with you that knows Jesus like you do. When are Christians going to stop making enemies out of each other? And 
you want to weary of this preacher, keep being hateful towards each other. You'll wear me out. It's not everybody, but some cannot seem to find any way to move on. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Paul gave of his strength. He had a very Christ-like spirit. On many occasions, he nearly died, and eventually he did die for the cause of Christ. He sacrificed of his strength and of himself in a Christ-like spirit for those who did not love him back. Christian, it means what it means to be like Jesus. It means to sacrifice. It means the sacrifice of ourselves. It means the sacrifice of our strength. It means the sacrifice of our time and of our rest. It means the sacrifice of our riches for the good of others. It means the sacrifice of all that we are for the good of others. Turn your Bibles, if you would, please, to Philippians chapter 2, and I need to be done. Philippians chapter 2. Yea, and if I, look at verse number 17, sorry, Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 17, I realized before I started reading it, I didn't give you the verse yet. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. You know why Paul was able to sacrifice of himself? For others, because he loved them, and because he lived for a greater cause than himself. If I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, you know, it takes dedication to a greater cause to live a sacrificial life. We are less willing to sacrifice when our greatest goal is to please self. The opposite of sacrifice is selfishness. And the person who lives for self cannot see the need for personal sacrifice. Paul was willing to make a sacrifice because he saw the greater cause that stood before him. How many men have died on the battlefield because they were willing to give their life for a greater cause? One of my daughters did a report on Medal of Honor recipients last year for school. We, as she studied some of those things, I, I began to read them again and, and, and look into them again. And I'm always amazed, and my patriotism in my heart grows when I read about somebody who stood until he couldn't stand anymore for his brothers and his friends. Some of them heroically made it out and books have been written about some of those men and some of them are worshipped in society and I, I don't say that negatively necessarily. Worship is probably the wrong word to use but are uplifted in society and I believe that they should be for the sacrifice that they made. But they did that, many of them, for a cause that is even less great than the soul of another human being. They were willing to die for their country and make the ultimate sacrifice. And the truth is that we as Christians, if we're going to be able to live a sacrificial life, we have to see the bigger picture and we have to be willing to live for something that's a lot bigger than just us. You have to be willing to live for those that are lost and see the great need that they have to be saved. That's what Paul said. He said, look, 
If I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. He was willing to come to the church of Philippi and give of his own life so that they could first of all enter into the faith and second of all after they received the faith that, that he was willing to continue to minister unto them so that they could grow in the faith. And he said, if I die for this, it'll be worth it and I joy in it. And I don't comprehend that in my flesh. I wish I did. He had attained a different level of big picture sight in his spiritual life that all of us ought to strive towards. We'll never be able to make sacrifices until there's something bigger worth living for, your family above yourself. You can't sacrifice for your family. You can't do what you should for your family until you put them before yourself. Society is filling up with young men that don't want to work. They want to have physical relationships and have children, but they don't want to sacrifice anything to take care of anybody because it was all about them to begin with. The entire process was about fulfilling their own lust and then after they fulfilled their own lust, having a child was a burden, not a blessing. They weren't in it for somebody else. They weren't in it for their family. They were in it for self. And so they continue to demonstrate that by not getting a job and living off of the welfare system and playing video games and binging Netflix and not doing anything to take care of a family while the mother then has to do everything in her power to go out and take care of the little one and try to raise that child as mother and father, which is the most difficult task known to man as far as I know. To try to play the role of both mother and father for some lazy, selfish person that decided that it was all about them instead of their family. You'll never be able to make sacrifices for your family until you place them above yourself. Until their well-being and their good is what you live for. The betterment of your marriage will not happen until you are willing to put your husband or your wife above yourself and consider them first. Being willing to change for the future of your marriage, not just living in the current gratification of the marriage that you have and in the things that you can do for each other. Instead of living uh, for, or should I say, instead of uh, allowing the other person to live for you and gratify you, it's time to give up on self and live for their betterment. People make financial sacrifices now so that they can have a better future. They put away money for savings and so on. What is that? Living for a different cause beyond just self-gratification right now. It's when you get a bigger picture and you live for a bigger cause that you can, can begin to make sacrifices. And that's exactly what it takes to live a sacrificial life is love and living for something bigger than yourself. The Bible tells us that we are to be a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. Because the Lord gave all for us. What it means to be like Jesus, it means to sacrifice. That's what He did. And that's what we, as His people, should be able to do. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that You would please help this morning in the hearts of Your people. I pray that you would please, through your Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do. We pray this as we ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. All righty. I believe if the Lord allows me to do so, I'll preach on the theme here in just a little bit. And so be in prayer about that and come ready for the Lord to do something in your heart. About ten minutes from now, we'll have church. Until then.